databases last time, and we went over it just sort of as an overview perspective to sort of uh, review the, the main concepts of databases. And again, um, to reiterate those, databases store data about multiple entities, first and foremost. We talked about forming a definition, and, and we said, well, let's just describe it instead of trying to form a formal definition. But if I was going to make a formal definition, I'd say something like databases contain information, contain data about multiple entities. So it's not just one thing in a database. There's a bunch of things, entities. And what's more, in addition to the entities, the relationships between the entities are also recorded in the database. And they're formally recorded in the database via foreign keys. It's not just like, well, hey, this column in the spreadsheet probably is going to match up with this column in some other spreadsheet. You actually define a mechanism called a foreign key that forces those two things to match up. So that you can't put something in one thing that doesn't match up with something in the other table. Um, we talked about each row in the database having a field that uniquely identifies it. Uniquely means only one, right? Uh, and that is called the foreign key. Oh, I'm sorry, that's called the primary key. Uh, we talked about um, having a uh, field in another table that points to the primary key, and that's called a foreign key. And that's how the relationships are implemented. Uh, there are different kinds of relationships, and we'll explore them um, as we go forward. Uh, the main relationship that we're going to start out looking is what's called a, a one-to-many relationship. Where you have one thing on one end that relates to multiple things on the other end. Alright? But those multiple things only relate back to one in the main table. So let's, um, let's put up some, let's put up a database Let's create just a sample database, and we'll throw in some um, rows and some tables, and we'll show how to do this in ASP.NET. We talked about how what we're going to do in general is we're going to cycle through, and uh, we're going to um, talk about um, some database theory, I guess you'd call it, or, or, or database fundamentals concepts, I probably is the way I want to put it. Then we're going to talk about some SQL stuff, and then we're going to see how we do this in ASP.NET. Now, at least for the first few examples, um, we're going to use Access, not because I have any great love of Access, but because of the convenience. It's in every lab. You're likely to have it installed on your computer. Um, it makes for simplicity. Um, everything we talk about, though, as far as the ASP.NET side, also works if you use other databases. In fact, back in the old days, pre.NET, this is when it was just plain old ASP, I worked on an application where I had a local version of a database in Access on my machine, and when I was at the office connected to the network, I would connect to the Oracle version of the database. And it worked both ways. All I had to do was switch one variable in my application the connection string. Uh, so we'll see how connection strings allow us to point to a database. And if the databases are the same, theoretically you can change a database as far as the type of database it is, maybe the location of the database, and all you need to do is change it in one place, the connection string, which is something that we like, right, as developers. When something changes, we only have to change in one place. So let's think of something for um, a database. And I, I, I really am lacking imagination today. All right, So we're just going to continue the example we had last time where we have faculty and we have classes and that kind of thing. So forgive me all right, for my lack of imagination. I'll try to do better in subsequent weeks. All right, so I'm going to define uh, First, our first task is just to define a table in an access database, which I, I would hope you'd all be able to do fairly easily. Um, and then we're going to put it on a web page, which, you know, 
you will be able to do pretty easily, but you probably haven't seen it before unless you've done it on your own. I need something to project on the screen. I need like, because I noticed the videos, probably the first 10 minutes of the videos is just a blank screen because some days I feel too lazy to get up and stand up in front of there and talk, so I just turn it, you know, I just turn on the recording and all that. I need like a Max Headroom kind of thing, for those of you that remember Max Headroom. I should actually work on an animation that is responsive to audio so that the mouth opens and closes based on me speaking. The Rocky Horror Clips. Yeah, somebody, <laughs> there you go. There you go. That would be, that would be awesome. Uh, all right, so let's go. And let's start, first of all, by defining a, a database in Access. Should be no, shouldn't be very difficult, at least the first pass. So I'm going to start off by defining a faculty table, right? Because everyone knows the world centers around faculty. No, I'm just kidding. There are faculty members who actually believe that, though, all right? Um, and I'm not going to say any more about the topic, all right? So I'm going to go and open up Microsoft Access. Access. It was at the very top. Like oh, under Access? Yeah, Access? Okay. I was expecting it said under Microsoft Access. Or under Microsoft Office or under something, something. They give a lot of templates and stuff to you. We're going to ignore them, right? We're not people making cakes out of box cakes, right? We're people making cakes from scratch because we're going to make great cakes. So I'm going to pick a blank database. And I'm going to put it somewhere. And I'm going to put it just on the desktop for now. This is going to move, all right? So for now, I'm going to put it on the desktop. And I called it database one because I am not thinking this morning. But I'm going to change that from database one to college database. All right. And now I'm going to click, click create. I thought I had already created it. Thank goodness I have the opportunity. So it gives you one table to start, right? Sort of like by default, because like kind of like why would you create a database if you're not going to have a table on it? So it gives you one to start. So I'm going to, you, you can enter data this way. And again, this is, the, this is the, 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 the tool that people that don't really know a lot about databases would use in creating their database. I'm not saying that to like make fun of them or anything. That's one thing that I don't like really is when IT people make fun of users, right? Um, so I try not to have that kind of attitude. So I, I'm not making fun of this, it's just that our job is to, to learn stuff from the ground up, the nuts and bolts of it. So we're not going to use some of these shortcuts that are available for people that maybe need to do something but don't have a lot of training in databases. So I'm going to right mouse on this and I'm going to say design view. At that point we're asked to give the table a name. All right, And I'm going to give it a name that's meaningful. I'm going to call it faculty. And I click OK. All right. Then I get a list of fields that I can add to the table. All right. By default, it gives you a field named ID, which is an auto number field. All right. Some people like this, some people don't. An auto number field is a field that is just going to sequence through. One, two, three, four. So the very first row I insert is going to be one. The second row I insert is going to be two, three, and so on. It doesn't reuse the numbers. So if I were to delete three, for example, the next number it would create would be four. It wouldn't like go back and reuse three. All right. Um, and it makes that the primary key. There, there's, there's, you know, this is one of those topics like. Any other topic, if you go out in the web, you'll hear people debating back and forth whether it's good to use a generated key like this or to use another type of key. The other type of key is called a natural key. This is called uh, a surrogate key. Uh, an auto number key.
speaking, the benefit, the benefit for me is that, number one, if we do this consistently, all, all of our table's primary keys will look similar. And that's a good thing. That allows you to do some cool stuff programming-wise. Also, all our keys are going to be numeric. All right? And that's also a good thing, because numbers can be stored more efficiently than characters can. All right? And it's easier to link things with single part, one part keys. Now, the opposite, the, the thing is, though, is like if we use an auto number key, that number doesn't really mean anything outside of the database. A natural key is a key that means something outside the database. For example, if I were to use email address as a primary key to this table, I could do that, right? And an email just means something outside the database, right? It's what you use to email someone with, all right? Or, and this would be a bad idea for other reasons, a social security number. That means something outside the database. All right. Of course, with social security number, there's privacy concerns and all that. Um, but those things mean something in the real world. This auto number key doesn't matter anything to anyone except the database. So some people think, well, it's better to use a natural key, better to use something that means something instead of introducing this, this, this uh, extra number. I kind of like using the extra number just because it's simple and straightforward. The one thing I do, however, is I will give the field name the name of the table plus ID. By default, they just call it ID. I think that can make it confusing, right? So I will call it faculty ID. So I will take the name of the table plus ID, and that will be, in, in most cases, that will be my primary key. All right? By default, because it's an auto number key, it is uh, a long integer. It'll be incremented to get the next number. It is indexed with no duplicates allowed. All right. We'll talk more about indexes later on. All right. But no duplicates, if you remember, is one of the characteristics of a a primary key. You can't have two people with the same ID number. I'm going to go put some of the other fields. So I'll put first name, which is a short text. We'll look at some of these other attributes in a minute here. Last name, short text, office, short text, email address short text now higher date will be a date time notice I'm using the first letter of every word higher hate higher date using the first letter of each word capitalized. Database columns and tables are not case sensitive, so it really doesn't matter. I just do that just for consistency and just so that I can read it. Um, okay. Now, if you notice for each of these fields, there are other attributes that we can set. We're going to look at two of them, mainly. Last name. Required. It would make sense that in a faculty database that you would have to have a last name, right? You, you can't say, who's teaching this class? Well, Bill is, you know? I, I don't know. It doesn't seem right. So we're going to make it required. Allow zero length, no. Indexed. Index allows for quick retrieval using that field. So for example, let's say you went over to a department here on campus and they asked you, your, they probably would ask you, the first thing they'd ask you is what's your student number? You know, you go to financial aid or you go to 
uh, enrollment services or whatever. First thing I'll say is, what's your, what's your student number? Why? Because that's the primary key. That's the easiest, most straightforward way to look something up is by its primary key. All right? If, however, you don't remember your student number, all right, uh, they're then liable to say, like, well, what's, what's your last name or what's your name? And then they can look you up by name, all right? Now, there's a lot of students on campus, all right? Uh, and, and, I mean, there's a lot of students enrolled at LC, even forgetting how many are on campus at the moment, but there's people that maybe took a class last semester and they're taking a semester off. There's people that just started this semester. So there's a lot of people in the student database, more so than the total number of people that are enrolled. Now, depending on the size of the database table, if you had to look through every student to look for your last name, that could take a while. All right? Now, we might be not be talking about days. You know, we're better than that. But it might take, you know, 30 seconds, let's say. Well, 30 seconds for an application is a long time to sit there waiting. All right? Um, if, however, there's an index, you can jump right to the person's name and find them quickly or find all the people that have their same last name. Like, for example, if your last name was Common, you could look for, if your last name was Davis, for example, you know, something that was a common name, you could do a search for Davis and it would bring you to a list of the Davises and they'd say, well, which Davis are you? You know, do you live on this street or that street or what's your first name? And they could pick it. But still, that's going to be quicker than searching through them from the beginning to end. If a field is not indexed, then a sequential search has to be done. A sequential search is where you start at the beginning and go all the way to the end, looking at each one in order. That would like be the difference if a library didn't have any sort of indexing for its books and just had a bunch of shelves with a bunch of books in. Can you imagine our library if there was no sequence that it was stored in, no index at all? All right? And you wanted a book. What would you do? Well, you literally have to look at the first book on the shelf. Is that the book I want? You'd be very lucky if that was the case, but probably not. So you look at the next book, then you look at the next book, and the next book, and the next book, all the way through until potentially you got to the end of all the books in the library. Well, that is a very time-consuming task. And essentially, that's what a database would do if the data is not indexed. What the data is indexed is, though, what that means is you can jump to a certain section and start looking. So books are indexed in a library by uh, the Dewey Decimal System or whatever. So if I know I want a book about uh, American literature, uh, I think the number for that is like 813.54. I don't have to start at book 000, 001. I can go right to that section and then start looking. All right? That's what an index provides. All right? Now, within a computer database, you have the benefit that you can make several things an index. All right? Um, and that has the advantage, then, of giving you multiple ways to look something up. Think of a library. Think of an online library. You can look books up by subject, by author, by title, and maybe by something else. I don't know. I, I remember three or four, but at least book, title, author, and uh, subject. Well, that gives you three ways to find books. So that's good. That's more flexible. If I know I want a book about cross-country skiing, I can put that in and see what they have. If I know I want a book by Mark Twain, I can type in that author and see what they have. If I know I want a, the book called Tale of Two Cities, I just type that in. All right? Why not make more things indexed? Why not make the number of pages in a book? Why not have an index for that? Or the city it was published in? Or how big the book is? Maybe I want to read a, a book that's so big today. So look by the size of the cover of the book or whatever. Why don't they do that? Why do they just stick with city, not city, um, title, Subject and author. Yes. It's, it's a 
information that's not relevant to the person? Yeah, it probably, I mean, it's probably going to be a very unusual circumstances where someone says, I only read books that are 8 by 10 or bigger, right? Maybe. Um, unless you're talking about large print books, but that's a whole other topic, right? Or, I only want a book that has 300 pages or more. Well, you probably don't look for books that way. I don't care what it is as long as it has more than 300 pages, right? You might like longer books better than short books, but still, you're going to want to search for a book about something and then look for the longest one, all right? So the point is, is that extra indexes don't, aren't always a good thing, right? If they're relevant and they help people search, then they're a good thing. If not, they just take up more resources. Because for every index that you create, it's going to involve a longer time to do an update or an insert or a query, and it's going to take up more disk space. So in this case, we would look at stuff that we thought was meaningful. The primary key is always the best way to go about it, because we know that it's unique. In, our, in this table, I would say last name, yeah, that's probably a pretty good thing, because Let's say you wanted to look up your professor's office hours and you, you didn't know their ID, all right? You probably don't. How many of you know my ID? You don't, know, all right? But you know my last name. At least most of you do, right? I've had people write the wrong name on my evaluation. Professor Zimmerman uh, did a great job. I have to say, I pay attention to all the evaluations I get, but if you get my name wrong, I'm not going to pay too close attention to it, all right? Just, I'm just saying, all right? So if, you're what, if you want your comments to be counted more heavily, use my name. Or if you don't know my name, just skip it. Don't even say. Say Mr. Z, all right, or whatever, or Mike, you know, and that would be better. So in this case, uh, last name is probably a, a reasonable way to look it up. Maybe email is a good way to look it up. The point is, is I'm not going to go in and... I'm not going to go in and make everything an index just on the odd chance that someone might want to query the data that way. I'm just going to make things indexes where I think it's going to benefit. Sort of as an aside, a DBA, that is a person whose job is to, to manage and administrate the database, if there's like complaints like, gee, this application is slow, one of the things that they do is study the indexes and see what maybe adding an index would help things out. You can actually run a query and have the database show you how it's accessing the data. And if it ever does a sequential read, you know that's a place where you might be able to improve it. You know. But anyhow, that's sort of an aside. We're just going to, for the sake of argument, assume email and last name are um, both things that we want to look up for. So we'll make both of those indexes. I'm going to go in and make sure I fill in what is required. So I'm going to say first name and last name are both required. First name is not indexed, though. All right. Office. Should I make an office required? I'm going to say no. I'm going to agree with you. Why do I say that? Might be one more person in the same office. Could be, well, you might be able to handle that if you make office required, but... At least the last class, adjuncts don't have an office. Yeah, adjuncts don't have an office. Maybe a new hire. When a new hire is processed, maybe they don't know their, their office yet. All right. Um, that's a possibility. So they might not have an office assigned yet. Um, so I'm not going to make office required. Um, hire date, though, yeah, I can pretty safely say that's required. If they weren't hired, then we're not interested in this. Now, index on date hired, I don't know. All right, I'm, I'm going to leave that off. I doubt that would be needed, although eh, maybe yes, for some reports it would be. Now notice the difference when I make an index on law, last name versus email. For last name, I say, 
Oh, I forgot to index it. I'm going to say index and duplicates OK. Why is that? Because two people have the same last name. So you don't want your index to only allow one person with the last name. It would be a shame if, like, the world's foremost expert on a topic wanted to come to teach here at LC. And we looked and we said, well, it, what was that guy's name? Neil deGrasse Tyson came to teach here. That's his name, right? Yeah. And we looked and said, sorry, we can't hire you. We already have a guy with the last name of Tyson. <coughs> you know, too bad. You know? That'd be horrible, right? So we're not going to make the last name unique because there could be two people with the same last name. Email address, I'm going to make unique because everyone should be assigned a unique email address. All right, even adjuncts have an email address. Um, the only way I would make that not unique or make that not required is in the case of adjuncts, adjuncts might not get assigned an email address their first day. It might take a while. But I could still make it not required, but unique. What that means is you don't have to have an email address, but if you do, it better be unique. All right? So that's what I'm going to do with this one. Now, here's a, here's, here's a rule as far as designing applications that relate to databases. All these things that I'm doing now, where I'm talking about whether the field's required, whether it's indexed, whether it is unique or not. Those are all called database constraints. All right? Normally, when you think about constraints in your everyday life, you don't want constraints. Right? I don't want people telling me what to do. All right? I don't, you know. But in databases, it's great to define constraints. Why do I say that? Why do I say it's good to define constraints in the database? To prevent mistakes, to improve the quality of the data. All right? So if you can't assign two people the same email address, I'm going to make the database not allow two people to be assigned the same email address. If the rule is no, when you hire someone that day they have a day they have an email address, then I'm going to make it required. If the rule is, yeah, everyone has to have a first name and last name, then I'm going to make that required in the database. Now Here's why maintaining them in the database are especially important. Because that's not the only place we could put the constraints in. We could put validation in our code that looked for people with the same email address, or required a last name, or required a first name, or required an office, or whatever. And we might still do that, right? But it's important to put them in the database, and here's why. The database is sort of the last line of defense. Now, access works a little different than this, but we can still think of in these terms. Here's the data in the database. Whoops. There's a program that does all the accessing and retrieval from the database, and that's called the DBMS database management system. Now one of the things in a database, in addition to the data, is the structure of the data, what tables are, what keys exist, and so on, and also the constraints. I could have multiple applications accessing the same database. And all of them might be able to change data in the database. All right. Give you a for instance. There is a web application. There's a website for LC's Canvas. There's also an Android app for LC's Canvas. And there's an iOS app for Android. For, for Android Canvas, right? For LC's Canvas. I built the rules 
into the applications, I could get them wrong, one of the applications. All right? For example, I don't think you can upload an assignment without putting a title on it. All right? I think that's a rule. All right? If it isn't, humor me and let's pretend that it is. For some reason, the people that made Canvas thought that that was important, that that's a constraint. If it was only these programs that did that validation, then you're at the mercy of your least skilled programmer, right? Because let's say the person that worked on the website is brilliant. Let's say the person that worked on the iOS application is brilliant. Let's say the person that worked on the Android app isn't quite so brilliant and doesn't do things right all the time. So, if the constraints were not defined, were, if the constraints were only in the application, then data coming in from this route could be bad. All right? Could have bad data slipping through. But, to the rescue, like the cavalry, is the DBMS. Because if you build the constraints in the database, then it doesn't matter how you try to get data in to the, the database tables. You might have access directly to the DBMS. You might be using the DBMS to do stuff. If those constraints are built into the database, then no one can get bad data in here. So if I make, in the database, if I make the email field a required field, and I say the email field has to be unique, it doesn't matter what path that data comes in, how the data comes in, that constraint's going to be enforced. All right? So I'm not at the mercy of my worst programmer. All right? Because even if they don't do the validation correctly, the database simply won't allow bad data to get in. All right? And that's like a huge win, right? Remember we talked about last time, garbage in, garbage out, right? So therefore, anything we can do to improve the integrity of the data, to make sure that it passes the validation rules, is going to be a big win for us. So where we can, we define all our constraints in the database. We might still have validation here. Okay, just to make it easier for the user or whatever. But we're going to make sure constraints are defined in the database. All right? So, that's why we define constraints in a database. Just real quick, you want to allow bad data to what? To, to get into the database. So that's why it's important to go through and fill in all these extra fields. Sometimes in class, if I'm doing something quickly, if the, you know, there's only a couple minutes left in class and I'm making a table, I might forget to go in and fill some of these in. But especially required, indexed, and so on, I'm going to make the email address required and index with no duplicates. These constraints especially are important to get right in the database. Now, there's a term for something like email address in this example, where I've defined it as required and I said it must be unique. What's the term that we've heard for something that was required and unique. What did we call that before? It rhymes with rosemary free. Primary key. Primary key. Very good. <laughs> Close, yes. Yeah. Something that's required and by necessity unique is similar to a primary key. Therefore, it's called the candidate, a, a candidate key, all right? Because we, if, if it's truly required and it's truly unique, 
then we could have made that the primary key if we wanted to. I could have done this table with email address as a primary key, but I chose not to. And that's what you do with primary keys. You make them required and make a unique index on them. I think the faculty ID is better because, again, numbers are more efficiently stored than characters. An email address is going to have characters in it. This auto number field is just going to be numbers. Okay. So, I've defined this table. I'm going to close it and save it. I'm going to go in to this table and I'm going to enter people in. I didn't want to do Mike Sellers as a first name. Come on. Higher date. I don't remember his higher date. Is it required? Yes, it is. Well, let me enter it, unless I know it. So I'm just going to make one up. So I'm going to say he was hired probably four or five years ago. So I'm going to say hired 812014. And Doug Huber. Let's say I mess up and try to put the same email address for him as for me. It let me sort of. It hasn't, it hasn't actually tried to save the data yet. So it hasn't done the, it hasn't done the constraint check. So I, again, I don't know when Doug was hired. Let's assume he was hired in 2008. Ah, now when I go to save the data, when I'm all done, it complains about that. So notice that even using access itself, by hook or by crook, I can't get in data that violates the constraints. I just can't. I can't put in two faculty members with a primary key of three. All right? I can't put someone in that doesn't have an email address or a hire date or a last name. I can't put someone in with a duplicate email address. Just doesn't allow me to do it. All right? Which, again, is a great thing. Wonderful thing. Because that ensures the integrity of the data. All right? We'll see more examples of what we do to ensure the integrity of the data when we talk about foreign keys. All right? And we'll get to that um, eh, maybe today. All right? So we have our database, and we have our one table in it, and we have three people in it. So I'm going to close out of this. Here's my database. I'm going to make a .NET application to access the data in this database. So I'm going to go to Visual Studio. I'm going to stick with an empty version, an empty website. I'm going to put it on the desktop. And I'm going to call it College Site. Oh. I'm just picking a folder here. Here I'm picking the name. So I'm going to say College Site here. 
and we're going to click OK. It goes and does its thing. It's making that folder and creating the config files and all that kind of stuff. here and before I start doing it view solution explorer I'm going to put the access database <coughs> in with these files this is kind of similar to what I did with images all right I created an images folder and I put my images in there because my images were outside of the project structure you need to do this with an access application, or with an access database, rather. So I'm going to minimize this. I'm going to go into my college site, double click, and I'm going to create a folder called app underscore data. And that matters. All right, it should be called app underscore data because the app underscore data folder first of all, it has some security associated with it by default. And in general, that's where ASP.NET applications are looking for their databases to be in app underscore data. So I could change that if I really wanted to, but eh, who cares? All right, so I'm going to call it app underscore data. I'm then going to go and move my database in there. So here's my database. I move it in there. So create a subfolder called app underscore data and put your database in it. Okay. Doesn't show it here yet because, again, given that we did that outside of the Visual Studio GUI, Visual Studio doesn't really know about it. So I'm going to hit my little refresh button and then that shows me the app underscore data folder with the database inside it. You can then go and do some things with this database without even leaving .NET. So I can double click on it and say, okay, let me see what the tables are. There's the fields. Let me retrieve the data and so on. So that's something that's kind of cool. All right. Now I'm going to pull data from this table onto, from that table rather, onto uh, a web page. So I'm going to say file, new, file. I lied. No, I didn't. I haven't lied yet. All right. First of all, make sure you have college site selected instead of app data. Because if you notice, and this drives me just a little bit crazy, depending on what what folder you are pointing to, it gives you different choices. Because I am pointing at the app data folder, it gives me these things. And therefore, if I look, I won't find master file. All right? And or web page, the things that I probably am going to want to create. So I'm going to click cancel and be sure I'm pointing at the application. Then I'm going to go File, New, File. And now I get the things I would be used to seeing. I kind of don't like that, but, you know, what are you going to do? I'm going to make a master page. I'm going to make a master page even if I don't do anything with it now. All right? Why? Well, I'll have a place to put the common code. So later on when I do this example and I add something to it, maybe I have a faculty listing by name and a faculty listing by department. All right? I'll be able to put on the master page my navigation and say, here's my faculty listing by name, here's my faculty listing by department. So even if I'm not ready to do that today, I'm going to give myself space to do that. So I'm going to create a master page and
I'm just going to put some very basic stuff in here, like... H1 college site example for CISS 243. I'm going to put a menu on here. menu items, not go worry about a site map for this example. Home. Default dot ASPX. Always do that, edit menu items, and I will add a second one. And I'll say faculty list. I would suggest you take this approach too. For the first thing that you have to do, your little library database. All right, create a home page and create a list. All right. So I'm going to create a dummy home page and I'm going to create a dummy, not a dummy, but I'm going to create a faculty list. So I'm going to go here and inherit, create new file. Web form, call it default ASPX, select master page. I use the main master page. And I'm just going to put up home page here. Now, please remember I'm not developing a beautiful page in the interest of time because I have until uh, 11.30 to get through the part of the example that I want to get through. So I got 20 some minutes left. All right. You have more time to go and style this and make it look good and actually put some meaningful stuff in here. So I hate to say, don't do what I do, but do what I say, but yet here I am saying that. All right? So make the page look professional. Uh, I'm sort of serving as a reminder to you to uh, go in and at least create a master page and then give yourself a structure that this, this, that this assignment could grow, because uh, it will. So now I'm going to go in and do another one for faculty list. So I'm going to say new file, web form, faculty list, select master page, add, now I have my faculty list page. Well, remember, I can only put stuff in the content placeholder on any page that is based off of the master page. The master page gives me the common code. In this case, it's just really a header and a navigation. Each individual page is going to have its area where the code is customized just for that page. All right. Excuse me. Now we're going to go and we're going to bring together a web page and the database. And you do that through these data components. The two data components we're going to use are a SQL data source and 
a grid view. Typically, with all this database interactivity, there's going to be two aspects to it. There's sort of the data back end to it, the connection and the linkage to the database, and then there's the user interface, which the user is going to see and interact with. So there's always those two things going. There's a source of the data, and then there's the, how the data is going to be displayed. The SQL data source is, of course, dealing with the data source, where the data is coming from. What database we're using, right? An application could actually use multiple databases, all right? So we have to specify which database we want. What table do we want? What do we want to pull from that table? And so on. The, the grid view is the user interface, how we're going to show that data that we pull to the user. And in this case, we're going to show it as a grid, or in other words, as a table. So I'm going to go drag SQL data source into my content area, and then I'm going to click configure data source. Now, this is the first time we're connecting to any database in this application. So we have to define the database connection. Each subsequent time, we don't have to define a new connection. We can use the old connection. We go look at the drop down, and it knows that there is a database in the app data folder called College ACCDB. And so I'm going to pick that. I'm going to click Next, and it will ask me, what do I want to save it as? It will ask me, do I want to save it, and what do I want to save it as? I can't imagine not wanting to save a connection string, right? Because you're probably going to be using the database elsewhere, and why go through the hassle of recreating the, the, the connection string? So the vast majority of times you're going to pick, yes, I want to save this, and what do I want to call it? I'll call it college db connection string. And I'm going to click next. Now I specify what I want from the database. And I'm going to do it using a custom SQL statement. We can also use sort of a GUI to pick what we want. But I want to start out doing things the hard way and actually put in the SQL statement. So I'm going to say next, and I'm going to say select star from faculty. The way I've defined this, I want to pick everyone in there, right? So I'm not going to have a where clause. I probably want an order by because I want to put it in some logical order. If you don't give an order by, it's going to give it to you in whatever order it thinks it belongs. So I'm going to say order by last name. All right. I'm going to click next. And I'm going to test that query to make sure that it works. This can save you a lot of time. Right? Because if you don't test the query and you have a problem with your query, it can be troublesome trying to troubleshoot that. It's much easier to do troubleshoot a little tiny piece at a time. So I'm going to test that query, and there they are in alphabetical order. So I can hit finish. Now I want to show you something, because I said that we're going to save it in the web config file. So let's look at the web config file. And sure enough, here is my connection string that I defined. College connection string, college DB connection string. Notice that where it says data source, it shows the name of the database, and it shows this vertical line 
data directory vertical line. That is how yours should look. If you follow the instructions and do it the way I did, yours will look like that. <coughs> if you do it incorrectly, it will show you the actual physical path. C colon slash slash program files slash Fred Jones slash blah 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 blah. Guess what? When I download that, I don't have your name as a user directory on my machine. So it's not going to work. I do have a data directory on my machine though, because that is the default data directory, which is app underscore data. All right. The bottom line, if you see from data source, it doesn't have data directory, but it has actual drive and folder names, then you should edit it to look like this. All right. If you run into any difficulty like that, um, let me know and I can coach you through it. In addition, if you turn something in and it works on your machine, and I tell you that I got an error opening the database, this is probably incorrect. So that's the first place to look. And if you don't remember the instructions of what I said and how it needs to look like, then we can, we can review it and talk about it. One thing though, and again, this isn't me being mean, I don't think, all right? But generally speaking, if I try to run something and it just blows up, I'm not going to spend like much time at all troubleshooting it. I'm just going to tell you it blew up and, and it's your responsibility then to figure out what went wrong. Be glad to answer questions, but again, I'm not going to like say, oh, you put a comma in there where there should have been a period or whatever, right? I'm just going to say that there was a problem. All right, so we're almost there. We're halfway there. Because we've defined the data source. The data source, again, as the name implies, is the source of data. It's the pipeline from this web page to the database. And it's going to pull the data that you need for this particular page. Now, I need to put in the control for the user interface. In other words, how the user is going to see the data. Because any piece of data that you get a list of faculty members or whatever, you can display a bunch of different ways, right? I could show a table of them. That's what I'm going to do. I could show one of them at a time and allow the person to click next, next, next. I could put all of them on their own boxes, kind of like Canvas has, where there's like a panel for CISS 243, a panel for CISS 264, and so on. But the simplest way to show a bunch of data is with a grid. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, I'm going to do the bare bones absolute simplest to just get this running right now. The only thing you need to do then is say, I want to have for this data grid, for this grid view, the data source is SQL data source 1. Let's make sure we understand that. We have two things, two controls that are important here. The SQL data source and the grid view. The SQL data source is where the data is coming from. The grid view is how we're going to display that data to the user. Where it says choose data source is where you connect the two so that those two things talk to each other. All right? Now, we kind of can tell that we're on the right track, right? Because it pulled up my headings. That was, that's encouraging, right? So it knows that this data source is going to pull up faculty information and so on. So I go and, go and hit run. And... There's my grid from data from the database. Now, this is database driven, right? This is dynamic. So if I go here, let's say someone's using some other application to update faculty. I go like 
name is actually Michael. Mark's first name is actually John. And Doug's first name is actually Douglas. Guess what? As soon as I go and refresh this page, the changes are reflected. So it's database driven. It's dynamic. I didn't have to make any coding changes to that page because that page simply pulls what's in the data and represents it to the user. Now this is like the bare bones grid view. Right? We can style it if we want. We'll talk about that in a minute. First, let's talk about what if I forget to choose a data source. That's a common error. In fact, I guarantee I'll probably make that a half dozen times in class. What do I get? I get a blank screen. Why? Because my grid view is there, but I haven't said where the data is going to come from. So it doesn't know where to get the data from, so it doesn't display anything. So you have to pick a data source for that. And now it will show the data. I can do some very straightforward stylings by saying auto format. Colorful, classic, simple, professional, autumn, oceana, brown sugar, slate. I don't know how they come up with the names of these. Like, I like my grid views to be snowy pine. Or, well, no, I think the clover field is much more beautiful. But it's a quick and dirty way to format it. I would suggest, big shock here, you don't do it that way. All right? Go ahead. Uh, but I, if you had a new column after you already set this up, would it automatically update that too? Or would that Sometimes it asks you to regenerate okay. the, that. We'll, we'll talk about that more later on. But I'm going to say, yeah, don't pick that. Style it yourself. So I could make CSS rules. Well, to make CSS rules, what do I need to know? I need to know... What's the HTML that gets created? So I'm going to view source, and I'm going to see, as I would expect, this to be a table. So I could go in, create my CSS file, and say something like td, no, th, font size 1.3m, color red, And I can apply that to the master page. should be link. I wondered why it wasn't displaying, right?
And now when I run it, I'm going to set faculty list as my start page. That way I don't have to be looking at it to see it first. And we style it that way. That would be the way I would prefer to style it as opposed to using the auto format options. Um, more flexibility. The auto format options, I think they put in there because there's some people that are heavy duty C sharp programmers that don't really know a lot about CSS and therefore, well, this gives them a tool to at least make it look kind of nice. Whereas we want you to be full stack developers. Boy, I love that term, right? Uh, I just like heard about it like not too long ago. <laughs> I've always heard people throw out that term, but it was like, oh, that's what that means. All right. Um, I guess it makes sense. It's like, gee, I've been one of them for a long time then, huh? All right. We can further customize this. All right. We can further customize this by changing the titles on the data grid, uh, the grid view, and so on, or maybe even hiding it. So notice that by default, the column name is the header. And that's not too bad here, because I said first name, so that's pretty obvious. But sometimes you abbreviate. Maybe you'd say F name, or F and M or something like that, where it wouldn't be there. You can go in and edit the columns, and you can do things like, for example, maybe I don't want people to see the faculty ID number. First name, maybe I want the header text to be first, not first name. And the last name to be, oops, last and maybe higher date we go something like this maybe even format it if we want to we could format it to only show the date part because I think right now it shows the date and time all right uh, I don't really want to see the date and the time, right? Um, I want, uh, probably only just want to see the date. I don't think it's important to know that someone was hired on a certain time. So let's see in ASP.NET, <coughs> format, date, column, <coughs> and grid view. Date, first question. Format string of that in there. Yeah, there we go. That looks much better. Okay. So, what are we doing next week? More concepts, more SQL, and more ASP.NET stuff. For example, how would I make it to just see all of the professors in a certain department instead of all the professors? How could I click on a professor and go to a page that had everything about them, including the classes that they took or are teaching? How do I link tables together and so on? So that's what we'll pick up on next time. Any questions about this? All right, we'll see you in live.